All right, guys, so as you saw in the video, we got the engine running, but we had quite a bit of backfiring taking place. Um, that indicated to me that I had something going on with my valve system. So I closed it up for the night and uh, decided to come back down into the garage this morning and give it another go. Um, I didn't put it on camera, but the first thing I did when I came back down was take off the valve covers, and that's just... Ah, right here on the front of your engine. You got your aluminum covers that are normally here. I've already taken them into the workshop, so I don't have them right here to show you, but you know what they look like. Four 10 millimeter bolts that hold it on along with the gasket. And taking off the cover on this side, everything looked to be okay. Uh, this push rod is loose, but that's my fault. I did that. Um, everything was actually perfectly fine when I first opened this side. So I moved over to the other side and as soon as I opened this cover, immediately I saw the problem. Completely missing the push rod here, and that means that it is way down in the crankcase where it's probably slipped in um, and is floating around loose somewhere in that crankcase. And the push rod on this side is completely bent. So intake and exhaust both on this bank is shot. Um, uh, my guess is likely what happened is we loosened up in our valve adjustment and that's, uh, that just comes down to me not properly maintaining the tractor. I should have gotten in here knowing that it was a, uh, tractor with nearly 300 hours on it. I should have gotten in here sooner and, and tightened those down. So this is a perfect example of why periodic maintenance is so important on any piece of mechanical equipment. So now... What we're going to do is we're going to remove the engine from the tractor. We're going to bring it into the workshop and we're going to do a full tear down on it. Stay tuned. In order to remove the engine, there's a whole bunch of things that we need to disconnect, but overall it's a very simple process. So I'm going to show you the things that I'm going to tackle and then I'm going to put the camera on the tripod and just get to it. Uh, in no particular order, we're going to remove our heat shield that covers our exhaust. We're going to disconnect the fuel line from here after clamping it off, of course. We're going to disconnect our battery cables, obviously, the starter cable right here will get disconnected. Our main engine harness here will get disconnected. Disconnect our throttle and choke linkage. This will all get disconnected, disconnected here. And then we have to remove our four mounting bolts, one and then two on this side, and then three, and difficult to see, but right here, four on this side. And then we can take the bolt off the drive, pull, drive belt pulley on the bottom and drop that pulley in order to fit it through the hole in the frame through which the drive shaft will pull up. Okay, so again, none of that was in any particular order. That was definitely not a step-by-step uh, -step direction on how to do it, but I'm going to put the camera on the tripod now and get to work.
We now have the engine off the tractor and on the workbench. So we need to get the crankcase cracked open and see if we can't find that push rod that I know has slipped inside. The crankcase bolts are half inch. We're going to crank those off. off. Now, using your rubber mallet, give your crankcase a few taps, and it should just pop right off. And you're going to want to remember, before you do your work, Order yourself a new crankcase gasket because you will not be able to save the old one. As you can see. We'll get to the gasket cleanup a little bit later. So I had every expectation of finding my missing push rod in this crankcase. And surprisingly, I'm not seeing it. Which is very odd. Unless, oh, that would be why. Okay, so I have a little bit, about a three-eighths of an inch of oil in the bottom of the crankcase <laughs> and buried in it, two halves of a push rod. Looking at the rest of the, of the components inside the crankcase, it looks like we avoided any other damage. I don't see any scoring on anything substantial. I don't see any broken teeth on the camshaft, the crankshaft, or the timing gear. The governor looks to be intact, still functioning properly. So this is going to be a very simple repair, just a matter of getting the old pieces of the push rod out of the crankcase, getting some new gasket material, and reassembling. So we're good. All right, I'm going to get started on dropping these push rods in. An important note on these Briggs & Stratton engines, uh, Briggs & Stratton makes a, a couple of different flavors of their uh, engines. You have the Intex, the Vanguards, um, etc., etc., a few others. But for this particular engine, which is a 20-horse Intec, the Intec engines have a steel exhaust pushrod and an aluminum intake pushrod. And it's important to remember that and not get them mixed up. They're designed that way for a reason related to pressure, temperature, etc., etc. So the first one I'm going to be dropping in, as you'll see in a moment, is an exhaust valve, and that's going to be the steel. Um, for those of you who are backyard mechanics, not really familiar with doing this kind of work, it is okay to ask the question, which valve is which? I get that not everybody understands that on first look. So the easiest way, this may sound silly, but there's folks who need this reminder, uh, the easiest way is the exhaust valve is the one closest to your exhaust pipe. The intake valve is the valve that is closest to the top of your engine where your carburetor and your intake are located. So exhaust valve close to the exhaust. And it's okay to ask those kind of questions. Don't ever feel stupid because you don't understand something. Everybody has their own um, depth of skill at doing this sort of work. So we're going to get to work on the, in on the exhaust one. And that is as simple as, so the first thing I've done, which I know is going to be tough to see here on camera, um, and again, I apologize, I'm here by myself, so I can't have a lot of good camera work, but we have our pusher on the bottom here, which rides against our cam lobes on the camshaft, and I've already verified that those are still in position, still functioning the way that they're supposed to be. 
which means that all I need to do is drop the push rod down into the head into the into the crankcase. And that is going to be done right here. So this is my exhaust valve, right? I know that because it's next to my exhaust pipe. So all I'm going to do is looking down in that hole, I see the bottom of that lifter. And I'm just going to drop that down. Find the hole that it slides into. Okay, like so. So the intake valve on this side is bent. Um, so for this one, we're going to go ahead and do the same thing, except that this time I've got to get the old push rod out. So we're going to loosen that up and just twist that out of the way like that. And see, we have a we have a bent intake push rod there as well. So we actually had a couple of couple of things going on with the push rods on this bad boy but this is the same thing again I've already verified that my lifter down there is is properly seated everything is in time the way it's supposed to be so this is going to be a simple case of dropping the aluminum push rod down seat it underneath the rocker arm now there's going to be a lot of folks who are going to criticize some of this work um, they tend to be the internet uh, garage maestros um, keeping in mind that this video is designed to help the backyard mechanics it's not designed to be a how-to video for a qualified uh, master certified Briggs and Stratton engine mechanic this is how to do the techniques that will get you where you need to be the fastest and most efficient and most importantly most cost effectively way possible so you can save yourself a little bit of money by doing the work yourself if you feel like you have the skills then that's the way to do it so now I've got my two push rods in aluminum on the intake side steel on the exhaust side now we're going to spin this guy around and take a look at the other side okay now on this side the exhaust push rod is in pretty decent shape um, I'll have to adjust the valves, but we don't have our pistons in the proper position to do a valve adjustment yet. So just verifying that's all snug and good to go. We're gonna take our aluminum push rod. Just make sure you don't have any grit or debris or anything on these. You don't wanna introduce anything into your oil unnecessarily. So you know, always try to be as clean as you can. Um, I know I sound like a broken record, but again, just reminding you that I've already verified that the lifters are sitting where they need to be. This one, yeah, I'm not going to be able to get this one in without compressing. So I don't know if you can see it under my hand, but basically what I'm doing is I'm pulling up on the end of the rocker, pushing down with the heel of my hand right here on the spring to kind of wiggle that back and forth a little bit, which enabled me to get that push rod seated in there. And then I'm just going to verify that our mounting bolts are as snug as they need to be they are this one it's actually rounding out a little bit so i think i'm going to grab myself a 5 16th uh six point socket i'm using a 12 point right now i'm going to grab a six point so that i can get a more solid bite on that and just verify that it's as tight as it should be so here we have a six point five sixteenth socket um 12 points are great when you're getting into tight places and that's tight so that's fine but um a lot of times 12 point sockets can actually be your worst enemy when you're working on old equipment where the bolt heads or the nuts might be rounded out a little bit a 12 point socket is far more likely to strip around the the uh, mating surface than a six point will a six point gives you a much better bite in those circumstances so we have our push rods in everything's good to go so now we need to adjust our valve clearances. According to the Briggs & Stratton manual, the 20 horsepower intake engines have a valve clearance for both intake and exhaust valves of between four to six thousandths of an inch. Valve clearance is defined as the contact space between the head of the valve and the bottom of your rocker arm. 
that's where we're going to be inserting our uh, feeler gauge to see where we're at. In order to do that, we need to have our piston set to about a quarter of an inch below top dead center. So in order to find out where our piston is, we need to remove our spark plugs using a 5 eighths of an inch deep well socket, preferably a spark plug socket, which is what this one is. Um, see if I can get that to focus on there. Spark plug socket. I'm pretty sure, I might be wrong, but I'm pretty sure this particular socket was owned by my grandfather many, many, many years ago. It's been kicking around my dad's toolbox for most of my life and now my toolbox. So this goes to show that when things are built well, they do last. Uh, while you have your spark plug out, take a bit of a look at it. Now, this is actually, it's in good shape. I don't see a whole lot of degradation of the plug itself, but um, it's pretty black. So I'm going to take a look at that after we get through all the valve stuff. Let's pull the plug out of the other side. Now, if you're doing this with the engine still in the tractor and you have the crankcase sealed up and all together, it becomes very important to remember not to allow any kind of debris to fall down into your spark plug holes. So if you're pulling spark plugs while the rest of the engine is sealed, just Watch the area that you're working in to make sure you're not dropping any kind of crud down there. So same thing here. This plug is physically in good shape, but it's it's actually drier than the other side was and pretty black. So again, I'm going to take a look at those issues once we get the valves done. Had a little bit of an incident off camera. Um, one of those silly stupid things that we all do sometimes. I was rotating the crankshaft to get the pistons into position so that I could show you all how to adjust the valves and the rag that I had in my hand to get a grip on the end of the crankshaft, a little bit of it that I wasn't paying attention to got stuck between the timing gear and the camshaft drive gear and the little tug I gave on it to pull it out, yanked the camshaft out with it. So, okay, we got the camshaft out, not a big deal. But I figured I'd take this opportunity to show you uh, what you're looking for when you're inspecting your camshaft. So the most obvious thing, of course, is making sure that all of your teeth are solid and well-defined. No broken teeth, nothing that's abnormally worn. And this one is in real good condition, exactly as I expected it to be. There is one chipped tooth right here. But I've had this engine apart before, and I recall that from the last time that I did a rebuild on this engine. So uh, I know where it came from, and I'm not worried about it. The other big thing you want to inspect is your lobes. These are the lobes that push up on the lifters, which carry the push rods inside your valve train. You want to make sure that these lobes have a good, let's see if we can focus on that. There we go. Uh, make sure that these lobes have a good apex point on that teardrop shape, because without that, and as you can see, this camshaft, all four of them are in great shape. But without that good apex of the teardrop there, you're not going to get the proper amount of valve lift as that comes around and pushes up on the bottom of the lifter. You're going to have a reduced amount of valve travel, which is going to mess with your uh, entire combustion process, depending on which um, valve is being affected, intake or exhaust. It'll, it'll have different effects on your whole process. So... Just make sure you're giving that a good inspection. Um, and then again, when it comes time to reassemble it, just make sure that you don't have any abnormal grit or anything. Make sure that your oil passages are good and clear. Everything looks good. When you put it in, you have a timing mark right here. And that timing mark has an equivalent mark on the timing gear on the crankshaft itself. <clears throat> excuse me so when we put this back in make sure that your lifters are up and out of the way make sure that your timing mark on your timing gear is toward the top of the engine kind of that way that I'm pointing up that way and your mark on your camshaft will be facing it down here so we're just going to slide that in line them up and again make sure that we're looking good with our lifters Line up our governor gear as well. Give everything a, a 
quick visual check, and we're good. Now, the downside to this happening is that I now have to go back and reseat all four push rods. All four push rods are now completely out of their seats. So I'm going to go ahead and do that real quick. Now that I know that the camshaft is back in there so the push rods cannot fall out the bottom, I can put my attention to them up here. Get that tightened back down. Now because of the design of the rocker arm, the looseness or tightness of these mounting bolts here do not affect the actual looseness or tightness of the valve. Keep that in mind. Your, uh, excuse me, of the rocker arm, I mean. Your rocker arm tightness is purely defined by the travel of the valve and the push rod in relation to the camshaft. Okay, now we're actually ready to get these valves set. Uh, the three things that you're gonna need in order to do the valve adjustment is a set of feeler gauges. Again, uh, as I mentioned before, I'm going to be using the five thousandths. I don't know if you can see the five on there. There we go. Um, I'm going to need a T40 bit. Okay, that size is T40. You're going to need a 13 millimeter socket. And the way you're going to do it is you're going to loosen this set bolt right here and once that is loose, you'll be able to turn the T40 screw that's in here, and that will loosen and tighten the amount of pressure, or the, more accurately, the amount of travel that is allowed on the push rod inside the bottom of that screw, which has got a little bit of a divot in there where the push, head, uh, the push rod sits into. You're going to stick your feeler gauge in between the top of your valve head and the bottom of your rocker arm, as we previously explained, and that's your adjustment. In order to do that, make sure that your piston is a quarter of an inch past top dead center. I already have mine set, but if yours is not set, just give that crankshaft or top a good spin until you have your uh, piston on the side that you're working on pulled around to top dead center. You can verify that by sticking a screwdriver down into the spark plug hole like so, and as your piston travels, the screwdriver will go down and up with the piston. It's a very simple indicator of where you uh, are at as far as the piston goes. So as I mentioned, I already have mine set at about a quarter of an inch below top dead center. And below, by the way, means past, right? We discussed that. So now I'm gonna take my 5,000 feeler gauge, make sure I don't have any debris or high spots on it that will throw off my adjustment. And I'm going to loosen my set screw, which I've already done. Did that off camera a moment ago while I was doing something else. I'm going to get my feeler gauge down in between the valve head and the rocker arm, like so. You can just give that a little press down on the top of your valve retainer, just like that. And now just give it a nice steady pull out and that's pretty tight so I'm going to back that off just a little bit that may have been too much little movements on this we're, we're literally dealing with thousands of an inch so yeah, that's actually a pretty decent drag I might tighten that just a just a smidge And nice even drag right there. Now I'm going to tighten that set bolt, or excuse me, set nut back down up. So I'm going to go around and do the other three valves now. I don't need to have that all on camera. You've seen how to do it once. The other three are going to be the same thing. So we're going to pause the video here. I'm going to get those three done, and then we'll move on to the next step. So now that I've got all of the valves properly set, um, I've got a, a nice smooth five thousandths pull for the uh, valve adjustment on all four of them. So we're good there. It's time to start buttoning this thing up. 
need to put our crankcase cover back on. Um, when we put the crankcase cover back on, a few things to watch out for. Number one, make sure that your gasket mating surface is nice and clean so that you can get a good proper seal on it. I've got a little gasket material left up here, so I need to scrape that off. Make sure that your guide pins here and here are still in the crankcase. Sometimes they, they pop out with the crankcase cover, so if they're not here, then check your crankcase cover. See, that's all they are. They're just little pins, and that's just the guide pins for putting the cover back on. Um, also need to make sure that you have your oil pump key, which I have misplaced, but I'll find it in a moment. It's in my little pile of stuff that I've got going on here. So you want to make sure that you have your oil pump key so that you can put it back uh, at the end of your camshaft. And that is what will drive your oil pump, of course. And then um, we need to get our governor reattached. We took that apart when we first took the uh, crankcase cover off, as you recall, and then put our uh, valve covers back on with new gaskets. Make sure those are properly torqued down, properly torqued down all of the bolts for the crankcase cover, fill it up with oil, and get it back onto the tractor. Actually, we'll get it onto the tractor before we fill it up with oil, but don't forget to fill it up with oil. So here we go. All right, one of the things that I forgot to mention at the beginning of the video was... Uh, that I had already ordered all the parts that I had, um, gasket set from Amazon as well as the push rods. And I'll have links to those in the description below, which you probably have already discovered at this point of the video, but um, we're not gonna be using all of the gaskets that are in this set because we didn't tear apart everything that this gasket encompasses, but we are gonna be using, of course, the crankcase gasket, and we're gonna be using the uh, uh, valve cover gaskets, which are, yeah, it looks like they're right here. So those are probably the only couple of things that we're gonna be using. I actually just replaced the oil seals last year, the last time I had this engine torn apart. So uh, I'll inspect them again to make sure that, are in, that they're still in decent shape, but I don't expect that they're gonna cause me any problems at all. So it's time to put the uh, gasket and the crankcase cover on the engine. Now these gaskets you can put on dry. Um, you don't have to put on any kind of an RTF or any kind of a uh, gasket sealant on them. You can put them on just as they are. The nice thing about these is that they are, uh, they have holes in them that match up to your guide pins that we discussed earlier. So they're very easy and quick drop on process just like so, but just make sure that you do give it a, a little bit of a verification check. Um, make sure that all the holes are lining up the way that they're supposed to be, that you don't have any defects in the gasket. Um, you know, I, I think a lot, of, a lot of homeowners tend to put up with leaky lawn mowers, um, lawn tractors, when you don't really need to. A properly maintained and properly assembled engine should not be leaking oil. And, you know, don't believe anybody that tells you that, you know, oh, that's just the way things are. That's how it's designed or, you know, it's common with that engine. That's that's a cop out for not wanting to take the time to properly assemble the engine. Just going to let some of the oil from the cover back into the crankcase. Um, I, I actually recently did an oil change on this engine, so... Uh, I'm not too concerned about the condition of the oil that might be in residue. So what I should have shown you, I have my finger holding the oil pump key right here. That key is down inside here. Make sure that's in there. That's what drives your oil pump. So make sure you have that in there the way it's supposed to be. And then drop your crankcase cover down over ah, down over your engine like so just get the excess oil off my hands here so that i can actually hold on to things okay so the first thing i'm going to do is just kind of clean off the outside of this oil seal just a little bit get that gunk off of it okay now, before I drop this down into final position, I just want to make sure the holes of the gasket are lining up where they're supposed to be. Everything seems to be right where it needs to be. So to make this a little easier on myself, 
I'm going to go ahead and pop the cover, the oil pump cover, off of the crankcase cover so that I can properly rotate that key into its mating slot on the camshaft because otherwise I'm just going to be sitting here fighting with it for far too long trying to get that to line up. So three five sixteenths bolts. Be careful that your magnet doesn't stick to your case and then you end up losing it. And let's get that pump rotated. we don't want to do is let that uh, seal fold upward and that's kind of what's happening right now take some oil and just get it good and lubricated you want that output shaft to just come right up through that seal and not bend the inner lips of that seal out. Otherwise, you're going to have problems. Okay, so basically what I'm doing is I'm just trying to keep the lip of that seal from coming out with the output shaft. There we go. That's what we want to see. All right, now start lining up our bolts and we'll grab our impact wrench and drive them home. I'll put the uh, torque values that you need to watch for in the description of the video as well. So if you have a torque wrench, you'll know what you need to have it set to. I always recommend getting your crankcase cover bolts um, hand started at least several threads uh, because otherwise you can end up potentially stripping them out when you go to drive them in with your with your driver whether you're using a uh, whether you're using an electric or a pneumatic impact driver or an air ratchet um, or you know even if you're using a, a hand ratchet if that's all you have available just Make sure that you're not stripping out those threads because once you do, now you're into drilling and helicoil territory and that just makes everything a whole lot messier than it had to be if you had just done a couple of preparatory threads before you began. Now, if Briggs is anything like all the other automotive manufacturers that I've worked on over the years, they have, I'm sure, uh, some kind of a pattern that they want you to use when driving home your crankcase cover bolts. I don't know what it is. I really don't care what it is. Again, we're backyard mechanicking. So I'm going to use my head um, in terms of how I think an appropriate pattern should be. Essentially, all you're trying to do is 
first of all, never ever tighten down all of your bolts until they are all down snug because otherwise you risk uh, misaligning your holes. Second of all, you want to make sure that as you drive them down to torque spec or, or uh, you know, rough guesstimate of tor torque spec, that you're not warping the seal between the cover and the crankcase. And if you were to go in order all the way around, driving them down to full torque, you would definitely risk warping that seal. So ideally, you're going to do sort of a, you know, some kind of a cross pattern where you're equalizing the pressure on the pan as you go around. So that's what I'm going to do right now. I'm going to have my uh, impact driver set to its lowest setting. And I'm just going to run these down to close to snug. Okay, that just gets everything seated down there. So now I'm actually going to go around and, and snug everything right down. Okay, now I'm just going to bring my impact wrench up a setting and just give that one final little snug. Okay, let's go ahead and put our oil pump assembly back together. Just make sure it's clean. See, I got a little hair on there. I don't know if y'all can see it, but I don't want that. Just make sure it's clean, no debris. Slide it into its slot, and then your inner piece, same thing. Inner piece is shaped to match the shape that's on the end of the key. So you're just gonna figure out where you need to be located in order to get that to met to made up. And it just drops right in there. Now we're just gonna put our cover back on. Clean that up a little bit if it makes you feel better. It's gonna get dirty within your first hour of using your lawn tractor anyway. That's all done. Just getting some of the some of the oil I spilled earlier taken care of, and then I'm gonna get these uh, valve covers put back on. I had said way back when I first started today's work that I figured I only had about an hour's worth of work left. Um, all things considered, that's an, still an accurate statement. I'm just doing some things for the camera that are slowing me down but realistically it was only about an hour's worth of work between the time I put the push rods in set the valves and uh, button everything all back up so we're, we're, we're doing pretty well here okay so for the uh, valve covers same thing as the crankcase cover just make sure that your mating surfaces are Nice and clean. Make sure you don't have any debris that might get down into your engine. Pull this back a little bit so that you can see. And then you're going to want to have your inside of your valve covers nice and clean. And then put on your, your new gasket. Okay. And you can put your gasket directly onto the mating surface of your of your uh, cylinder head. I am not going to lie, I'm actually kind of cheating a little bit. Uh, because I had this these valve covers off a while back, the gaskets that are on them are still in really good shape. So I'm just going to be lazy and keep them on there. Um, I don't see any issue with them at all they're obviously compressed from the last time they were put on but other than that they're fully intact and there's just no reason to waste a set of gaskets that i might need again in the future so i'm just gonna use what i've got all right so your valve cover uh bolts are three eighths
Now, some people will tell you that you can also use 10 millimeter, which I believe is what I actually started this video off using way back when I first took the valve covers off. Um, 10 millimeter and 3 eighths are very close in size to each other. That's really loose. So you can get away with either one, but just keep in mind that this 20 horse Intec V-Twin from Briggs is not a metric engine. Everything on it, for the most part, um, where there might be one or two little exceptions, but I don't, I can't think of any right off the top of my head. Everything on it should be SAE, not metric. So let's snug these down again. I have no doubt that there are documented torque values for these bolts. Don't need them, folks. Just use your head. Tighten them down snug. All you're doing here is preventing oil from leaking out. Okay. Oh, okay. See? So look at that. So that gasket has split. So it looks like we actually are going to be replacing one of our two gaskets. So let's get that cleaned up. And we'll put a new, a new gasket on there. And get that reassembled. FYI, your two gaskets for the port and starboard side are identical for the valve covers. So don't worry that you might be grabbing the wrong gasket. They're, they're exactly the same for both sides. Again, make sure your mating surface is good and clean. I know, broken record, but it is important. You can put your gasket right on there. You don't need any kind of uh, gasket sealant or anything like that. All right, here we go. So I'm just going to slide this on. Notice I kind of partially grabbed the uh, vacuum tube coming out of the fuel pump. And now I'm just going to push that. Boom, just like that the rest of the way on. Grab our bolts. Get those started. Okay, that's it. That engine is back together. Now we're going to go throw it on the tractor. Put some oil in it. Get everything connected, see how she sounds. Stay tuned. Okay, so as you can see, we have the engine back on the tractor. Um, I didn't bother filming the installation of the engine back onto the tractor. I just didn't see any point. I think y'all are intelligent enough to know that installation is basically the reverse of disassembly. So taking all the uh, disassembly steps that we did back in the beginning of the video and reversing them. I have the engine back on the frame, the uh, mounting bolts, again the four corner point mounting bolts that go up through the bottom of the frame are now back on. There we go, two on each side. Um, everything else is put back together. I have routed and attached the choke and throttle cables. Here's your throttle cable and the choke cable and I also went ahead and set the governor assembly. Um, there's a lot of videos out there on how to set the governor assemblies on these V-Twin Intex so I'm just going to let somebody else do that. Um, I might link to one of the more helpful ones in the description below. We'll see. Okay so basically all I have left to do, you see that the dipstick is sitting on top of the engine. I still need to put some oil into the engine. I need to reconnect the negative cable to the battery. Um, and I think that is pretty much where I'm at. Obviously put the, the uh, air filter back in and then we're going to fire it up. So I will keep filming from this point after I put the camera on the tripod.
fuel. So basically what needs to happen is we need to draw the fuel from the line into the engine. We need to make sure that we have a little bit of lubricity in the pistons with that fresh oil in there. So I'm just gonna give that a little bit of a spin there. So basically what I've just done is sort of manually gotten some oil up, up into the works so that they're not trying to start dry. Um, now, that should be everything I need to worry about. Let me, let me put the lid on this oil here so I don't have an even bigger mess when my clumsy self kicks the cork over. All right. So if the battery still has a charge after being in this cold garage, in theory, we should start. I'm going to pull the choke. Okay. Well, I can tell you right now, I do not like where that choke is at. So I need to readjust how I link that up. That's that's not feeling very nice. The, the throttle cable I paid close attention to when I attached and adjusted it. Um, I should have paid a little more attention to the choke, but we're going to try to start it anyway and see what happens. And here we go. And there we go. I'm happy with that. Uh, you saw a moment ago that I was kind of putting my hands all over the engine. Basically what I was looking for was any indication of any kind of a vibration, something that tells me that a part of the drivetrain is out of whack. Um, if I have rockers that aren't uh, engaging properly, if I have something wacky going on with just the balance of the engine, then you would feel that, right? You can put your hands on the valve covers, put your hands on the top of the air cleaner, just kind of feel it. And, they, and you can tell, and she was running real smooth. So I'm very happy. Um, you know, again, the only thing that we did here is we replaced a couple of push rods. So there's nothing here that needs break in. This is not, you know, I need to take it easy on the engine for the first 10 hours or anything like that. This is an already fully uh, uh, broken in engine. So I'm going to put it all back together and, and put it right back out to work. Um, so that's going to that's going to be about it for this video. Uh, I'm not going to bother recording, putting all the rest of the uh, accessories on the air air filter cover and the uh, exhaust cover and the hood. I'm not going to do that. Um, but what I am going to do is my next video, while I still have all this apart, I'm going to show you all how to attach the brackets that are necessary for having the John Deere 46 inch plow. So look for that in a separate video. Really hope that this uh, process that I've shown you on how to do this has helped. I know it was a very long video, um, but I know there's a lot of y'all that are out there that, you know, look at this stuff and you don't have the greatest mechanical skills, but you feel like maybe you can tackle it. Here you go. It's pretty simple to do. Take care, y'all.